From CGTN headquarters in Beijing, this is The Hub with Wang Guan. Hello and welcome to The Hub. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. Pakistan has started a new chapter under Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif. This ends a week of constitutional crisis with former cricketing great Imran Khan ousted by a no-trust vote. Mr. Sharif, 70 years old, comes from a veteran political family. His brother Nawaz Sharif, if you remember, was Prime Minister of Pakistan three times. He himself was Chief Minister of three times of Punjab, Pakistan's second biggest province. Can the new captain bring stability in Pakistan? And how will he tackle three key relationships with three neighbors of Pakistan, namely Afghanistan, India, and China? For more on this, we're joined from Islamabad, Pakistan, by Mushahid Hussain, Senator and Chairman of the Senate Defense Committee. Senator Hussain, great have you with us. Uh, welcome to CGTN. Thank you very much. Greetings from Islamabad and good morning to you. Uh, greetings to you, Senator. Uh, first of all, can you bring us up to speed with the latest situation in Pakistan? I mean, is life back to normal? Because we saw protests or protesters. Um, by former Prime Minister Han supporters uh, outside the, the parliament? Well, the uh, situation is now finally stabilized. The transition has been relatively smooth. And uh, Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif has hit the ground running. He is uh, meeting people. He is trying to form his new cabinet. And he's given his clear priorities on domestic and foreign policy. And you can see a rise in the stock market also. Uh, the biggest in the last two years, and you've seen a decline in the rate of the dollar vis-a-vis -vis the rupee. So that's a good sign that the markets are stabilizing and people and the life is returning to normal finally. Yeah, let's talk about the stock market for, for a second because <clears throat> we saw the market being very volatile. The Pakistani rupee, like you said, was falling, falling uh, in case our audience are not uh, <clears throat> terribly familiar with this. Uh, you know, the party of... Um, Excuse me, I was talking about the stock market. In fact, some numbers here. If you don't mind me showing you guys, um, stock market up by 1,444 points. That is a good sign. And also the dollar down to 182 from 189. But other than the stock market, how is the Pakistani economy doing? Is it also stabilizing? Also, I would like to say that the, uh, yesterday a public opinion poll took place and that showed that 50. 7% of Pakistanis have uh, accepted and welcomed the change in government and they have approved of the change in government. So this has been a smooth, democratic, peaceful, constitutional transition. And also politically also, this is a huge coalition. I would call it a rainbow coalition because it comprises nine political parties from all sides of the political spectrum, the liberal left to the religious right, the middle of the road and uh, parties representing all the provinces. And remember that in the last elections, while the previous uh, ruling party got 32% of the popular vote, those who did not vote with the previous party and those who were opposed to him were 68%. So those 68% are now represented in the current ruling coalition. All right, Senator Hussein, we know that Imra Khan had an international standing as a cricketer. A very successful one, we all know that. Uh, what led to his downfall? Uh, what would you consider to be, say, two, three major factors? Well, there's no doubt that Mr. Imran Khan has been a cricketing legend, a superstar in the field of sports and philanthropy and public figure for the last 30, 40 years in the Pakistani national scene. I would say that, uh, of course, he came as an inexperienced person in government. and. Uh, some of the factors that led to his downfall, number one, the inability to coexist with the opposition, which was a very strong opposition. You see, in a parliamentary democracy, uh, the government and the opposition are two wheels of the chariot of democracy. So uh, he opposed the opposition strongly, he demonized them, so, and he tried to marginalize them, which was not possible. Secondly, an inability to cobble a team a cohesive team that could deliver good governance. And third factor would be, I think, uh, bad handling of the economy. He changed four or five finance ministers and, uh, and the economy became a major issue. And then this, after the coronavirus pandemic, the spike uh, in prices and uh, inflation. So that, I would say, these were the major reasons for his uh, unraveling of his regime. 
Well, uh, that is unfortunate, uh, considered by some, but it's also the reality of uh, Pakistan showing really the growing democracy of Pakistan, like it or not, opposing forces, opposing views over there, checks and balances. And then do you think South Asia has or could have a, a tendency to follow a dynastic politics? Because in Pakistan, you have the Bhutto family, and now the Sh Sh Sharif family, like it or not. And also in India, we had the Gandhi family, and the same thing in Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. Well, in Asia, there is the politics of dynasty, and uh, that makes a difference. And even now, you can see, next month, there will be elections in the Philippines, and uh, President Marcos's son is going to be the next president of Philippines. And Marcos was president of Philippines 50 years ago. And in India, you have seen the same thing. In um, Sri Lanka, you have the Rajapakse brothers, and uh, that is a, a fact of life, that politics revolves around famous surnames which means their brothers, their fathers, or their mothers. And uh, that is an accepted reality of politics. And it happens sometimes in the United States also. You have the Bush family, of course, elected. Exactly. And uh, you have the Clintons coming in, uh, Bill Clinton and his wife Hillary. But at least, at le as long as they are directly elected and they're not part of any monarchy, I think the people accept that. All right, Senator Hussain, what about the challenges before Mr. Sharif, the new prime minister? Because Minister Han's members have mass resigned from the parliament. The new government might have to hold by-elections to uh, you know, re-elect up to 100 seats. And Mr. Han has hinted his opposition would continue. Uh, give us a sense of how big a distraction that would be for the new government. I would say that there are three paramount challenges for Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif as of now. Number one, he needs to give the country, Pakistan, a healing touch, a soft touch, because we have had divisive politics, we have had polarized politics, and the opposition at the government always having a confrontational situation. We need to be more consultative, more cooperative, and we have to work together, number one. Uh, so there has to be no politics of revenge, no politics of vendetta or victimization. Secondly, uh, stabilize the economy with a cohesive team, inspire confidence uh, among the people of Pakistan and the international community about the Pakistan economy. And third is that ensure there are rules of the game, electoral reforms to prepare for the forthcoming elections, which are going to come in uh, six months or nine months or within a year. So I think these are the foremost challenges. And then, of course, there are challenges of foreign policy also, uh, especially in our neighborhood, which requires peace, stability, and normalcy after four decades of war and after the American exit from Afghanistan. And another major hurdle is the court case Prime Minister Sharif faces, uh, along with his son, Hasma Sharif. Uh, this is a 7 billion rupee money laundering charge. You know this better than I do. Uh, for which Mr. Sharif was detained for more than a year and now he's on bail until April the 27th. How is he going to handle this? Well, I think the rule of law will prevail. Let the law take its own course. But the, previously, there was hounding and harassment of Mr. Shahbaz Sharif because he was leader of the opposition. And there was a lot of trial by allegation, and a lot of the allegations, in our view, were unsubstantiated. So let the allegations be proven in a court of law. Let the court take its own course. And I can assure you, there will be no attempt by the government to interfere in the process of the court of law. Because the judiciary in Pakistan, as you know, is very independent. And they ruled against Prime Minister Imran Khan. And they won't spare the uh, Sharif family either. In the past, Mr. Nawashi was knocked out by the same Supreme Court. So we have faith in the judiciary, we have faith in the rule of law, yeah. and we feel that the law will take its own course. Let's move on and talk about Pakistan's foreign relations, uh, chief among them with China. We know that China says its relations with Pakistan is uh, all-weather strategic, uh, comprehensive strategic uh, partnership with Pakistan. Um, I would say that is you know, one of the highest designation, if not the highest designation, uh, for Beijing's uh, foreign uh, partners and friends. And upon Mr. Sharif's election, China's foreign minister has spoken, actually. They said, China sincerely hopes that all parties of Pakistan can stay united and jointly defend national stability and development. We believe the political change in Pakistan will not change 
the overall China-Pakistan relations. Uh, what kind of China policy do you expect from the new Pakistani government? Well, uh, China has a very old and long-standing relationship with Mr. Shahbaz Sharif. When the Belt and Road Initiative of President Xi Jinping was launched, the PRI, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor is its centerpiece. And that was taken forward by Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif and his brother, Mr. Shahbaz Sharif, was uh, then the Chief Minister of Punjab. And in his first act, the first day in office as Prime Minister, Mr. Shahbaz Sharif met the Chinese acting ambassador and told uh, the Chinese acting ambassador that Pakistan considers China as Pakistan's closest friend and strongest partner, and we will take CPEC forward with new vigor, with new vitality, and in a rejuvenated manner. And you will see a broad-based acceleration in Pakistan-China relations in all domains. And China is number one in terms of our foreign policy priority, which the Prime Minister made clear when he listed the list of countries. And he, his formulation has been very warmly welcomed in China. So we have no doubt. And by the way, China is one country in Pakistan on which there's a broad, across-the-board national consensus. And even Mr. Imran Khan agrees with that. And even Shabash Shiv agrees with that, that China is our number one friend. So China friendship is the, uh, I would say, the cornerstone of Pakistan's foreign policy. And I see this relationship being further developed and taken to new heights of development. Uh, sir, we also know that uh, Punjab is also building a 1,000 megawatt solar park in Chinese collaboration. Plus, there is this China-Pakistan economic corridor under the BRI. Um, can we expect, you know, continued momentum in those projects? Yes, and not just momentum. I would say expansion, because we have the first phase of CPEC was completed under the period when Mr. Sharif was in power. In the first phase, the second phase has begun, and you will see perhaps acceleration in the field of agriculture, in the field of IT, in the field of tourism, and also infrastructure, especially the railway project. And uh, already yesterday, he announced in Karachi, the Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif, that they will uh, expand CPEC. So I think that you will see that uh, multifaceted development of CPEC. And CPEC also unites the Federation of Pakistan to infrastructure and energy. And it has resolved a lot of our problems. So we feel CPEC is the guarantor of a better tomorrow for the people of Pakistan. And Mr. Sharif, as Prime Minister, will take it forward. Senator Hussain, so good to talk with you. Come back again and please uh, forward our Thank best you. wishes and warmest greetings to the people of Pakistan, if you can. We certainly Thanks agree. Very Thank much. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Now, you've been watching The Hub with me, Wang Guan on CGTN. We'll be right back after the break. Welcome back to The Hub on CGTN. Now, let's look at the impact on the region and beyond of, by the, the changes in Pakistani politics. We're now joined by Anil Trigunayat, former Indian ambassador to Libya, Jordan, and Malta from New Delhi, India. Welcome, Ambassador. He's also yeah. the chairman currently of the Confederation of Education Excellence. And in Beijing, China, we're joined by Rong Ying, vice president of the China Institute of International Studies. Vice President Rong, good to have you with us again. Uh, gentlemen, let's talk about the relations between Pakistan and India, first of all. Ambassador, if I can go to you, during Mr. Yeah. Imran Khan's era, during his tenure, there was bad blood between India and Pakistan, let's face it. But after, you know, Ms. Sharif's election, there was some very cordial and friendly exchanges of words, of statements. We already saw that. Um, what do you think uh, the relations between the two can evolve? How do you foresee that? Because we know that Sharif family and India have had very cordial relations. Well, at the outset, I would like to wish our friends in Pakistan well and felicitate them on the smooth transition of power, uh, even though there was a lot of drama in that. But at the end of the day, I would say the judiciary and the democracy prevail to an extent. That's a positive sign. We, both the countries and the region actually are facing a lot of development challenges. And those challenges have to be met, not by war, but by peace. I dialogue. But uh, my Prime Minister has already congratulated uh, Prime Minister Sharif uh, on his election and expressed the desire that India wants peace and stability in the region, free of terror. That is a very clear word. So we want peace. We want to discuss all issues with them positively. And there should be peace between the two countries. 
uh, the, India prefers dialogue and diplomacy. But at the same time, the basic problem is, and secondly, if the army or the deep state in Pakistan is ready uh, to basically desist uh, from using the uh, state sponsored terrorism, uh, then I think that uh, things can move forward. Uh, and uh, there's a good sign at the moment, as you rightly mentioned, that uh, Prime Minister Sharif uh, is a good administrator and uh, he's more uh, pragmatic. And uh, therefore, if he and uh, he probably have the backing of the army as well. So if that happens and both are in the same uh, field, I think we may have uh, some kind of uh, uh, move forward uh, in the and rapprochement between the two countries. Vice President Rongying, let me go to you. As a Chinese scholar, how do you look at the changes in the Pakistani government? Well, I think uh, certainly Chinese, uh, uh, the Chinese government and scholars, academic community, friends of Pakistan are watching, following the developments uh, with great sort of uh, sympathy and the good wishes that uh, the political uh, sort of situation will stabilize and uh, the uh, uh, negative fallout would be uh, as less as possible. So we are, we are happy to notice that the uh, process has now calmed down and we are also very much pleased, I think, uh, by listening to uh, Senator Hossein's sort of uh, briefing about what is happening now after this uh, political sort of episode. All in all, I think Chinese uh, as good friend, closest friend of Pakistan, uh, wishing them well and is ready to help wherever possible mm -hmm. and where, whenever necessary. Vice President Rung, a quick follow-up. Do you expect any changes at all between China-Pakistan relations? No, no, absolutely not. I think uh, the Chinese, uh, China-Pakistan relationship over the past decades have now enjoyed a kind of unprecedented uh, level, uh, uh, privilege and the feature that whatever happens, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the relationship would not affect, rather it would become an, another opportunity to further deepening and strengthening the relationship. So it is a tested friendship, it is an all-weather friendship, it is a friendship that, would, uh, that has not been affected by the past changes and it would and it would continue to i think uh, uh, carry forward as uh, uh, the, the the congratulatory messages by chinese uh, premier li keqiang to uh, prime minister shabat shabat uh, uh, sharif and also i think in the meetings between the acting chinese ambassador and the, to the prime minister himself has said yeah, it is certainly a relationship that's tested by evolving geopolitical events. Ambassador Trigunayat, uh, let me go to you. The Ukraine crisis has shown a similarity in the foreign policies of three countries, uh, namely China, India, and Pakistan. Uh, they had their differences, especially among China and India and India and Pakistan, uh, when it comes to their foreign policy approaches. But this time around, we do see that all three countries refuse to toe the Western line of condemning and sanctioning Russia. Uh, do you think there could be, you know, uh, new bonding, if you will, between the three as they now see uh, how effective their similar responses have been in withstanding Western pressure? Well, I doubt that there can be a trilateral approach uh, because there have been fundamental differences in when India took its position or, for that matter, China or Pakistan took their position. There are nuances in approaches. India had a principled approach and has been against any external intervention, military intervention, and throughout the history it has opposed it. That is the one thing. Secondly, India also has a special and privileged partnership with Russia, but at the same time has a comprehensive global strategic par partnership with the United States. So India is trying and standing for peace, dialogue, diplomacy, sovereignty, and territorial integrity, and has been, and Prime Minister Modi has spoken to both President Zelensky and President uh, Putin several times and asking them to cease the hostilities and come to the dialogue, come to the table, and India is ready to do so, uh, even now, uh, to provide uh, whatever possibilities are there and is helping Ukraine as well by providing assistance uh, during this period. And as you know that we had more than 20,000 Indians who were stuck there and they had to be evacuated. 
So India's position has been principled position in that sense of the term, and I would say a position of sanity. Yes, of course, uh, we are we don't throw any line of any anybody as you know forever. This is the India's position, but at the same time, uh, I think that the, when uh, Foreign Minister Wangi visited India uh, recently, he had discussions uh, with uh, the Foreign India's Foreign Minister uh, Dr. Jayashankar, and they discussed uh, this, and both sides agreed that dialogue and diplomacy are the only way forward. So I think to that extent, uh, all countries must stand for peace and must try to bring about some kind of sanity in this war. Yeah, thank you for your perspectives on all this. Uh, Mr. Rung, I have a similar question for you. Um, how do you see the China, India, and Pakistan triangular relationships uh, evolving uh, now that uh, there is a new government in Pakistan? Well, certainly I think the relationships uh, among the three countries, the bilateral uh, ones, uh, have some uh, 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 implication or, Im or the impact the one way or another. But uh, as a scholar, I always hesitate to uh, draw a hyphenation, to hyphenate this relationship. But uh, uh, because from the Chinese perspective, uh, the two, uh, the, uh, its relationship with Pakistan and its relationship with India are all based on different merits for different uh, sort of uh, rationale. And uh, uh, with the, I think the uh, ongoing changes, geopolitical changes, uh, the changing dynamic in the region and beyond, uh, ch from the Chinese pe perspective, uh, China would continue with the wish to continue to pursue and develop its relationship uh, uh, with India, with Pakistan, respectively. And of course, uh, as a scholar, I understand there are some connections, but I, I would say that uh, uh, that connection is uh, not based on a kind of any geopolitical agenda. Rather, it is based on the reality, based on the history. And on the question of Ukraine, I think the uh, three countries do share some similarities, convergences on how the, 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 this conflict that has been, uh, what is the root causes of the conflict and how, what would the way out of that. And I fully agree with the uh, India colleagues, the panelists from India, the ambassador, that this conflict has to be resolved through political means. It has to, I mean, resolved uh, through dialogue and diplomacy. And in this regard, China, India and Pakistan can uh, coordinate or can work together at least to make our positions loud and clear to the international community. The United States, the West, the Europe in particular. There are a whole lot of common stakes uh, wherever and whenever you look at this uh, relationship or relationships. Ambassador Trigunaya, Pakistan was an ally of the U.S. during the war, the so-called war on terror. We all know that. But now Mr. Han says it was a U.S. conspiracy that removed him from office. Uh, on the other hand, despite historical closeness with Russia, India is now a strategic partner of the U.S. in the Quad. Could this new security equation create a problem in the region specifically? Could this heighten tensions between India, China, and Pakistan? Well, one thing you have to understand that Pakistan loves alliances. It was a part of the CENTO. It was a part of the U.S. alliance. It was a part of the non-NATO. Uh, it is a non-NATO ally of the United States. It's extremely close. So it likes to have big brothers as its uh, protectors, so to say. So that is its policy. As far as India is concerned, I think that India does not like alliances. In fact, it prefers to have alignments. And that's why trilateral alliances. As far as Quad, you mentioned, that Quad for India, as you know, my prime minister had spoken at Shangri-La and has been conveyed several times to our Chinese colleagues that it has nothing to do with containment of China. So therefore, there is no question. It is basically is for, not against, it is for the international order, it is for a free and open Indo-Pacific, it is for creating uh, synergies uh, among those four countries, because India is also trying to work out on its own, own uh, global value and supply chains, in which there are, as you can see, those who know that when you read the statement of the spirit of Quad, which is called, there were three or four areas that are very important for India's uh, own uh, uh, personal requirements. So this, this is what I feel that uh, we are not uh, looking at a conflictual kind of uh, uh, approach. So I doubt very much, of course, uh, the, the 
if there are problems in the region and uh, if those happen for that i think all countries including china must attempt uh, to to have a situation where we don't have any conflict well, I would argue that uh, Pakistan, you know, was, like it or not, an ally of the United States uh, in terms of the, the funding it gets from the U.S. and also uh, the level of uh, terrorist th terrorism threat it faces, you know, it, before, during, and after the so-called war on terror. In, in fact, Pakistan suffered more casualties than any other country during the war on terror. Uh, you can ask those Pakistanis living in Punjab about the fact of U.S. drone uh, attacks, which I did uh, some 10 years ago when I was there. Mr. Rong Ying, uh, do you want to respond uh, to what the ambassador has said? Well, yeah, that's exactly, I think, the, uh, the, the point where the uh, debate or the narrative of counterterrorism should, uh, should be understood. I think Pakistan has been the frontline state uh, in, uh, uh, in counterterrorism, and Pakistan has been the victims for terrorism and Pakistan has been making sacrifice and contributions along the line. That has to be really appreciated and understood. In the meantime, I understand that Pakistan itself is under the threat of radicalism, terrorism, and the international community, the United States and the others, the regional countries should help Pakistan to uh, to develop that capability and more importantly, I think, to manage, to address the fallout of, the, of that, uh, that uh, development. That is, I think, something uh, 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 China and the regional countries and uh, the international community should, it should do. And that is, of course, an, another important area uh, when I think the regional country, international community, when dealing with whoever sits in, is, is tam, uh, in, in yeah. Islamabad, whoever becomes the prime minister. Mr. Rohingya, sorry to cut you, and uh, Ambassador Tigunaya, I'm afraid that's all the time we have. This is a live broadcast, but do come back again next time. We do appreciate your perspectives. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. You. Thank you for watching The Hub on CGTN. Our news coverage continues. Bye and take care.